In this video, we're going to be going through some of my favorite clips from Jordan Peterson that I believe perfectly demonstrate not only how he has mastered the art of communication, but that also speak to his character as a man. And make sure you stick around until the end, guys, because despite all of the conflict and debate that you're going to see in this video, I believe that the last clip helps you understand the deeper underlying philosophy of why Jordan Peterson does what he does. So with that said, let's get into the clips. And the first one that I would like to look at is Jordan Peterson's debate with Marxist intellectual Slavoj Žižek. Watch this very closely, see what you pick up, and then I'll check in at the end and we'll compare notes. You're a, you're a strange Marxist to have a discussion with. And, well, but here's why. This is not an insult by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, one of the things that struck me when I was looking at your work was that you're, well, first of all, you're a character, you know, and that's an, that's, that's an interesting thing, like you're... Is this an insult or not? It's not an insult. <laughs> It's a sign of, it's a sign of originality, and and it's a sign of a certain amount of moral courage, and 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 it's a sign of a certain temperament, and it makes you humorous and charismatic and attractive, and um, and 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 I think you appeal to young people the way that outside intellectual rebels appeal to young people. Now, Jordan Peterson is extremely gracious towards his opponent here. And when he's giving these compliments to Zizek, he seems quite naked and vulnerable. And instead of just saying, yeah, you're a smart guy, but this, he gives some very genuine and thoughtful compliments. And the rapport that he builds with Zizek is evident by his reaction. You can tell that he appreciates how thoughtful and genuine Peterson is here. Peterson also endears himself and shows that he's actively listening throughout this debate as seen by his body language. He physically leans in to show the person that he's actively listening and not only listening, but trying his hardest to understand exactly what they're talking about and see things from their perspective. The following clip is from a Lex Friedman podcast where he asks Jordan Peterson, to steel man the case for Justin Trudeau. Now, for those of you who don't know, a steel man is the practice of addressing the strongest form of somebody's argument, even if it's not necessarily the one that they presented. And there is nobody in the world who Jordan Peterson has criticized more than Justin Trudeau. It's a brilliant question by Lex, and let's watch how Jordan Peterson responds. Can you steel man the case that uh, the prime minister of this country, Trudeau, wants the best for this country and actually might do good things for this country as okay. an intellectual challenge. Sure. Um, he seems to get along well with his wife. He has some kids. There's no sexual scandals. And he's in a position where that could easily be the case. He seems to have done some good things on the oceanic management front. He's put a fair bit of Canada's oceans into marine protected areas, and that might be his most fundamental legacy if it's real. I've been trying to get information about the actual reality of the protection, and I haven't been able to do that. But that's a good thing. So sorry, to the family thing yeah. is there's it some speaks aspect to his of, character. His character. There is some aspect to him who's that makes him a good man. Well, in that sense, I mean, there's the evidence there. Then I also thought, okay, well, after the liberals had brought in a Harvard intellectual who was a Canadian to be their last leader, he didn't work out, and then they're flailing about for a leader and the liberals in Canada are pretty good at maintaining power and leadership and have been the dominant governing party in Canada for a long time. And so they went to Justin and said, well, you know, it's you are a conservative and you can imagine that's not a positive um, specter for someone who's on the left or even a liberal, especially and Trudeau is quite a bit on the left. And uh, they said, we need you to run. And then I thought, okay, well, the answer to that should have been no, because the Trudeau, Justin has no training for this, no experience. He's not, he's a part-time drama teacher, fundamentally. He hadn't run a business. He just didn't know enough to be prime minister. But then I'm trying to put myself in this position. Eh? So it's like, okay, I don't know enough, but I'm young and we don't want the conservatives. And they had had a run, a 10 year run. So maybe it was time for a new government. I could, maybe I could grow into this man. Maybe I could surround myself with good people and I could learn humbly and I could become the person I'm now pretending to be, which we all have to do as we move forward, right? 
This response by Peterson is a perfect example of why he is not an ideologue. Imagine if that had have been somebody like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez being asked that same question but about Donald Trump. What do you think she would say to that question? Or do you think she would be able to answer it at all? I highly doubt it. Now we've had a look at how Jordan Peterson sets a good faith tone to his debates and carefully and gracefully analyzes his opponents. But now let's look at how he handles conflict. And he has certainly had no shortage of conflict. Watch how in the following clip, this individual tries to antagonize Jordan Peterson and how he responds. And then after, I'll explain my thoughts. Basically, it's not correct that there is such a thing as biological sex. And I'm a historian of medicine. I can unpack that for you at great length if you want, but in the interest of time, uh, I won't. So that's a very popular misconception. Well, I don't understand what the claim that there's no such thing as biological sex means. And I certainly think it's, let's call it an error to suggest that there's some si sort of scientific consensus about that. I mean, there's, there's biological differences between males and females in animals and human beings at every level of analysis. Now, I don't need to explain to the intelligent individuals watching this video that there is indeed such thing as biological sex. The way Dr. Peterson handled that was absolutely brilliant. You can see that this individual has serious contempt for Dr. Peterson. But instead of getting angry and being indignant about this affront to truth that has just been espoused by this historian of medicine, Peterson instead responds to the statements with a calm authority. He speaks nice and slowly. He loves lowers his voice, and he ends his statements with downward inflections. And it's interesting because the other gentleman is constantly using upwards inflections. This just makes him sound arrogant, and his voice is actually really annoying to listen to. I'm a historian of medicine at great length if you want. Uh, I won't. It's a minor detail, but the cadence and tone of your voice will greatly impact how receptive people are to what you're saying. I don't agree with why Dr. Peterson has been asked to stop abusing students on campus. To stop doing what? Abusing students. I see. You've accused him of abusing students by not using the pronouns they want to be addressed That's by. That's how I see it, absolutely. That is tantamount to abuse in your view. Absolutely. Many, many global documents, many how organizations. About is it tantamount to violence? Yes, How absolutely. about hate speech? Is it tantamount to yes, hate speech? Yes, of course. It's hate speech Fine, to tell that's... someone that you won't refer to them as a in a way that they uh, that recognizes their humanity and dignity. This individual has just accused Dr. Peterson of abusing students on television. In terms of outrageous accusations, there are a few things that you could possibly say to a professor that would damage their reputation as much as accusing them of abusing students. This individual clearly wanted to get an emotional reaction. He wanted Jordan Peterson to get angry. And if Peterson had have given him that, it could have potentially in some way validated the accusation that he just made. But instead, Peterson does a fantastic job of stepping back removing himself emotionally from the situation and simply asking a few very pointed questions. Peterson asks him to say the statement again, which means that he now has to double down on the ridiculous thing that he just said. And then he asks, is it tantamount to violence and is it tantamount to hate speech? Because both of those things are criminal offenses. Instead of attacking the idea and attacking this individual for saying that, Peterson simply facilitates this man's walk to the gallows by making him quadruple down on the absurd thing that he just said. The next clip is another perfect example of how Dr. Peterson never lets anybody push him around in a debate and also the perfect representation of how vigilant he is. But before that, I wanted to let you guys know that I've just launched my website. And if you guys enjoy this sort of content, then you guys will love the PDF that I've made with some of my favorite communication techniques. These communication techniques have literally changed my life and the way that I interact with people. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to make this knowledge extremely accessible to you guys. You can literally have it on your phone and pull it out in any situation. So all you got to do to access that is hit that link pinned at the top of the comments. Do you think a trans woman is a real woman? <laughs> I don't really like the way those questions are formulated. You know, I don't know what that means. What do you mean a real woman? Well, she I'm asking you, in your mind, you know, it depends what you think a real woman is, but do you think a trans woman is a woman? No. Why not? Because I think that women are capable, generally speaking, of having babies and they have female genitalia and they have an XX chromosome and, and I think the biological markers are relevant. It doesn't necessarily mean that I don't think that people should be treated with respect and dignity if they happen not to fit easily into a gender category. That's a different issue. Right. But, but it's a matter of definition and, and I actually think it's a foolish argument in some sense because what do you mean by real? Well, 
I mean, you've just clarified that, though. You, you, you don't think um, that a trans woman is a woman. And do you, do you think that that is what is behind or explains your opposition to this idea of a law mandating you to use a no. preferred pronoun is because you don't actually believe that that's the truth, that a trans woman is a woman and therefore you can't use that pronoun? No, that's not my argument at really? all. Really? Yeah, really. My yeah, argument is that the no, government I know what your shouldn't compel is. voluntary speech. No, but I know what your argument is, and no, you've made it very really clearly. It. But, no, but behind, that's exactly it. There's but the no motivation behind, behind no motivation it. behind it. But you don't believe I wouldn't put everything on my li online in my life to take the stance I did, unless I had thought that through very deeply. And I've thought it through very deeply. There aren't hidden motivations that have to do with some arbitrary prejudice against trans people. Okay. It's purely, pure and simply this. There's never been a time in English common law history where the government compelled speech and the Canadian government dared to do that. And that was unacceptable. And they masked it with this show of, of compassion for the oppressed. And I don't buy it. What we just saw there was a perfect example of Jordan Peterson catching the straw man. Now we talked before about the steel man. The straw man is the opposite of that. The straw man is when somebody intentionally misrepresents your argument in order to make it easier to defeat. You would have noticed that Peterson saw it coming straight away. In fact, he saw it from the last century and he was having absolutely none of it. This is such an important thing to know when you're having a discussion because straw mans happen all the time. And to be vigilant and to be able to understand when somebody is misrepresenting your argument and to be able to call them out on it is a very, very effective debate technique. The next clip that we're going to look at is Jordan Peterson talking to an extremely passive aggressive New Zealander journalist. Keep a very close eye on how this interviewer frames his question and then how Jordan Peterson frames his response. My experience is that men don't generally engage in their interactions on the basis of suppressing their anger, which is what you're really getting at. They don't engage in their interactions on the basis of, I've got to moderate... No, they, and they regulate their behaviour so that that anger isn't necessary. Yes. Why You strike me as angry and I wonder why you're angry. Um, I guess I'm not sure why I strike you as angry. You don't feel angry? At the moment? Mm. Not well, particularly. Well, okay, generally? No, I wouldn't say so. Wouldn't I'm, say I so. mean, most of the places that I go, look, I can tell you what my life is like. You can tell me if you think this would be a life that would make you angry. Okay, everywhere I go, I'm stopped by people at least a dozen times a day. I would say five times an hour. They're often young men, but not always. Almost all of them are exceptionally polite when they approach me. They'd like to have a picture, they'd like to talk to me, and they'd like to tell me why their life is substantially better since they've encountered my work. And I've gone to, I don't know, a dozen countries, maybe more, 15 countries, and talked to at least 10,000 people who've told me that story over and over. And so you imagine what your life would be like if everywhere you went, what people did was come up to you and thank you because what they did helped you not commit suicide and get out of your addiction and stop being alcoholic and take responsibility for your life and try to put your family together and that things are much, much better and that they're often in tears. It's not something that makes you angry. It's something that makes you hurt. It's not making you angry now. It's hurt. It's hurtful to see how much need there is for that in society and how unfortunate it is that people need such a small amount of encouragement to lift themselves out of those sorts of, pl of places of hell. And it is, it's, it is irritating to me, I would say, that men in particular, young men, have been discouraged to the point where that's such a common occurrence, when they need so little encouragement to move forward in a productive and progressive direction. Right. Now, first of all, guys, this is at the end of an interview where this passive aggressive journalist has been constantly poking at Jordan Peterson and trying to get a reaction out of him. And then at the end, he says, you strike me as angry. If it were me, guys, I don't think I would be able to keep my cool in this situation. But luckily, it wasn't me. But more importantly, guys, the interviewer framed his question as, you strike me as angry, I wonder why you're angry. And this is another one of those things that I've learned from Charisma On Command, who by the way, if you guys haven't checked out Charisma on Command and you're into this sort of content, then you're welcome. Charlie and the team talk a lot about catching the presupposition. And that is exactly what Jordan Peterson does here. The presupposition is that he's angry. He hasn't asked him if he's angry. He's asked him why he's angry. Those are two very different things. And Peterson responds perfectly. He says, well, I guess I'm not sure why I strike you as angry. He caught the presupposition instead of rolling with it. And like before, he removes himself emotionally from the situation. Instead of saying, no, actually, I'm really happy. And last night I went 
went and bought myself an ice cream and I put sprinkles on it. And I walked along the river and I'm so happy. That sort of defensiveness would not have looked good in the context of the question. So instead, he just says, this is my experience. Tell me if it's something that would make you angry. And I don't know if that one grinded your gears as much as it does me, guys, but Jordan Peterson's clearly not angry. He's passionate about what he does. And he's constantly moved by the people he meets. And he's constantly moved by the stories he hears. It's not him being angry. And by now you might be thinking, guys, Jordan Peterson is an intellectual titan. He could easily have his way with these journalists and with these people who are trying to slander him all the time. Why doesn't he just turn it up a few notches and destroy everybody in his wake with his linguistic prowess? Well, the following clip when he's talking to Charlie Kirk is exactly why. I believe that this truly encapsulates the philosophy of why Dr. Peterson does what he does and how he does it. He's talking at the Young Women's Leadership Summit. So he's talking to a lot of young leaders of the future. Charlie Kirk is a guy who's very intelligent and entertaining, but also very combative in debates. So it's quite amazing to see Jordan Peterson speak this profound wisdom in this setting. And watching these clips and making this video over the past few days, has made me want to be a better man and a better communicator. And I hope that it can have a similar effect on everybody watching this video. I was made aware of you probably eight or nine months ago, but where I really leaned in is when you just obliterated. Kathy New is that her name? Kathy Newman from the UK? Oh yes. my God. And what was so amazing about it is I, it seemed like you were being so kind and you were giving her as much opportunity as possible. I wouldn't say that I obliterated her. I would say I would. that she... <laughs> No, no, it's not true because what what see because obliteration requires force and and what I Well, it does it does and, and well, and I'm, I'm making a very a very careful point here and It's one you want to attend to very Very carefully because you, you're all interested in whatever you're interested in as a consequence of being here po political political um, Action to some degree I would presume but perhaps also psychological development. It's like what I did in that interview, and what I've been able to do a number of times with a certain amount of success, is apply the doctrine of minimal necessary force. And I'll tell you, this is a very important thing to master, and it's very sophisticated. I attempted to use minimal necessary force, and all I was doing was deflecting accusations that, as far as I was concerned, had nothing to do with me. And the reason that that was successful was was, was exactly because I because there was no obliteration that was just stepping back say well That's not accurate the way that you're formulating that and what happened was that she had to show her hand And it was it was her showing her hand that that produced the consequences That that, that were associated with that video she because I didn't Use force or any more than was necessary then she had to keep stepping forward with her Accusations and her ideology and she just laid it out completely so that everyone could see it And so it's another thing you really want to think about like you don't want to be thinking about this as a polarized political battle Because you're then you're in the damn polarized political battle and it's actually the polarized political battle. That's the problem now you, you, and, Now it's not like as I said already. It's not like you want to be a pushover but you step away from that and you, well, you work on yourself so that you're an increasingly powerful person. And, but one of, the, and one of the ways that you do that is that you learn to use minimal necessary force. It's like you don't defend yourself any more than you have to. Like, be careful. Don't push any harder than you need to. Because all you do is you generate a counterforce by, by pushing harder than you need to. And then, and then you're in conflict. And you think, well, I like a little conflict. It's like... Look, fair enough, a little conflict, man, no problem. It keeps your life kind of interesting, and maybe that's on the problem-solving edge. But a little conflict can become a lot of conflict very, very rapidly, and if you have any sense at all, that's not what you want. You know, especially if you have other things that are better to do, and you should have other things that are better to do. And so, you know, to, to, to deal with these sorts of things, even when you're provoked with a light hand, there is no more effective strategy than that. And it's a real mark of sophistication and your ability to keep your temper in check. It's really something to aim at. And that's, that's true even when you're dealing with yourself. You, know, you don't punish yourself any more than necessary. When you're negotiating with someone that you love, a partner, for example, or a husband or a wife, at least in, in, in principle, you defend yourself with minimum necessary force. When I've been successful, in responding to attacks, it's only because I've responded to them minimally. 
So, for example, there's been a number of times when I've gone to universities and had pretty nasty demonstrations. There was one at McMaster University that got quite out of hand, and a worse one at Queen's University, where people were pounding on the windows while we were all sitting in the hall. But it was the same thing there. It's like control of temper, detachment, understanding that the full event has yet to play itself out, the ability to step back, and the requirement to use minimal necessary force. And when I've been able to manage that, then it's worked. And if I get, if my temper gets riled up, and I have a temper, and if it gets riled up, and I start to lash out more than necessary, then that, that goes badly right away. And I can see that in the comments, and I can see that the memes that are made of me turn a little bit more mean instead of funny. And so, so this is really an important thing to know. It's like, keep your temper under control. Don't burst out into self-righteous anger, in particular against those that you might regard as your political enemies. It is not going to help you. It's not going to help the cause. It's not going to help anything. It's like if you're married to someone, think, well, I won that argument. It's like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't, because there that person is, waking up next to you the next day. And so if you won, you know, and they've, they're defeated, and humiliated because of it, then the probability that they're going to react properly to you if they have any sense at all is very low. And so, so what you want is you want, to, you want to negotiate your way to a sustainable peace. And that's what you want to do in the political realm too, because these people who are on the opposite side of the political spectrum from you, they're, they're the people who live across the street. They're the people who live down the street. They're family members for that ma matter. And you're going to have to live with them. It's like you don't want to defeat them. You want to bring them back into the reasonable political dialogue. And you do that by having a certain amount, first of all, by getting your act together so that you're a credible and admirable person. But then by having some forbearance and, and negotiating towards peace. It's, think about what you want as a victory. You want a victory that, where you're surrounded by the corpses of your defeated enemies? Or do you want a victory that constitutes peace? Well, that's what you want. So no victory. Peace is the goal, not victory. So That's great. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Don't forget to hit that link pinned at the top of the comments in order to access my free PDF about some of my favorite communication skills and techniques. And you can also sign up to my email list and you get another free PDF with my top 10 favorite movies, documentaries, podcasts, and YouTube channels. And I'll also be sending weekly emails from now on with a ton of value. So make sure you like and subscribe if you got value from this video. And until next time, I'm Jake. This is Rattlesnake TV.